I want to welcome you to Dream Shapes Radio with me, your host, Yaga Diamond. What's up, people? How you doing? It is a great day. I'm so very excited to have you here. We have an amazing guest on the show today. He has a book out called Laughing Through Life. I think it is. It's what it is. I think that's what it is, right? Yes, Laughing, laughing Through yeah. Life, which is what we just did, right? We just what? laughed a little bit. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll be right back. Don't you go anywhere. I did to be different. Thank you so much for joining me and welcome back to the show. We have Mr. Larry Morin here to talk about his book, but let's go back a little bit, Mr. Morin. Let's go back into the beginning. Did you know that you were going to be an author? Well, not really. I actually worked as a journalist for nine years in Indiana. Uh, I, I covered everything from sports to presidential politics. And then from there, I moved on to the federal government where I was an economist, but my job was to tell lies for the government. No, no, not lies. I was to explain the economy to reporters. And I did that for 33 years. When I retired, I decided to, to uh, do a little bit of writing. Uh, I wrote a book of, of short stories, fictional short stories, and I have a, a novel out, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, I decided to do something for my kids. I wanted to have some, uh, some stories about my, my growing up years and actually my career as well, uh, but mostly my family. I come from an amazing family. There, are, there were 10 kids in the family. We all love each other. We still do. We're all still alive. It's just wonderful. And um, so I wanted to share this with my kids, but I wanted to do it in a way that wasn't just re me t retelling stories. So I, a lot of the stuff in there is a little bit fictional. It's like I call it a fictional uh, biography, but it is really an autobiography of my life. Mm, I it's love like it. I love it. Give it to my kids basically as a Christmas gift one year. That's wonderful. Wonderful. I can see why you wrote a book called Laughing Through Life after coming out from the economy side. <laughs> That's yeah. a joke. Yeah. Oh my gosh, the way things are now, but we're not going to get into that. We're going to stay over the, on this side because I like this side better. I like laughing through life. So tell me about why you, I mean, I know you, why you decided to put it together, but the ultimate reason is that you probably wanted the kids to know, but why did you add that little fictional part to it? I'm trying to figure out how does that work in? Well, uh, I did it because as I was sharing this with other people, people who weren't parts of my family, I realized that you needed to have stories um, <clears throat> that would interest a broad uh, specter of people. Oh. And I actually believe this, the, the, the uh, title of the book is absolutely true. I have spent my whole life laughing because I find I find humor in most things I do, even in the economy, uh, but I have mostly uh, other experiences. And I just think laughter is a wonderful thing to share with other people. I think you're so straightforward that we can end this interview right now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> laughing through life right okay so let's go back in your high school years your college years did you ever or, I mean did you ever jot things down was there like an indication that you would become a writer well in my high school years I uh, was a reporter for three Indianapolis newspapers I shouldn't say reporter but I was the person who, who would call them and tell them about uh, my school's basketball and football and baseball games and when I came out of high school, there were 10 of us. So my dad really couldn't afford to send me off to college. And uh, I went to work for a newspaper as a sports writer. Uh, so I had wow. that ahead of time. And I worked as a sports writer uh, for about two years. Then I became very interested in, in uh, let's say, the political uh, atmosphere. And I actually moved into covering politics, which I did for another six years, working for various papers around Indiana. Wow. There's so many people that want to get into that. There's like the contributors online and then you have the actual physical uh, newspapers and, you know, magazines and stuff. You know, did you I mean, this is kind of like a, a really far off question. But when you got the, the jobs, when you got that, did you freak out a little bit? 
Not really. I was always actually sort of self-confident, felt like I could do a good job because I knew what I was writing about. When I was a sports writer, I knew sports very well. I see sports writers today that aren't really as interested in sports as, as I was. Uh, and then when I became interested in politics, and I'll, I'll tell you, one of my goals was when I entered politics, political writing, my goal was to be as fair-minded to everybody running for office as I could. And um, it seemed to work. And I had really close friends in the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Um, but, but my job was to report what they were saying, not to tell people who they should vote for, but to just sort of explain what these candidates stood for and what they might do. And it was a wonderful experience. So I interviewed Richard Nixon twice, mm. had dinner with uh, George McGovern once. Uh, wow. So I had, had some pretty decent experiences. It was actually, I can't say I interviewed him, but I was at the airport when, when uh, Bobby Kennedy came to Indiana on a presidential campaign about a month before he was assassinated. So it was really a mm. great experience. Wow, that is amazing. I mean, okay, so you've done all that. And a lot of people don't have that self-confidence. How did you get that? How did you, I mean, I know you knew. I mean, there's so many people out there that know, you know what I mean? They know more than right. some of these people that are already out there writing. But how do you get to the point psychologically that you know that you know that you can do this job and have the confidence to do it? Well, I don't really know how to answer that other than to say that I had a wonderful mother. She gave me self-confidence. She always told me I could do anything I wanted. She was really encouraging. She didn't know much about sports, but since I wanted to be a sports writer, she was very encouraging. My dad was also uh, very encouraging. But it was just one of those things where I, I loved this stuff, the sports I was writing at the time, and I just knew that I could do a good job. And as it turns out, I did. So I was going to tell you, when I came out of high school, I didn't have a college to go to because I didn't have the money. And mm. I was looking for a job at the time, and I was having real trouble finding a job. And I happened to talk to the sports writer for the Indianapolis Times, who knew me as a stringer when I was calling in about the Carmel games. And uh, he said, well, listen, Larry, when you go off to college, we want you to be a stringer for us there, and you can actually do more coverage. And I said, well, I, I'm not going to college right away. He said, what? I said, no, I don't really have the money. He said, come work for me. And that was actually, a, that, that will build your confidence if the guy just says right at the top, come work for me. So I did, and oh. I was, was there for three years. That is amazing. Okay, so now I know the big question is, in the room is, you jump from sports to politics. How did that happen? Well, I in, in the mid-1960s, that was a very, I actually think the 1960s was perhaps the most interesting decade uh, in the 20th century. I mean, we had everything from presidential assassinations. Uh, we had, uh, we were very close to nuclear war with the Cuban Missile Crisis. There were just many, many things. But at any rate, I was very much interested in what was going on at the time. And I felt that we, you know, as a journalist, I needed to know as much as I could. By the way, that is another key that I think in my, in my own personal experience, I love to learn stuff. Even to this day, I'm taking college classes to learn stuff. I just different and different things. Um, but that was a key. And so I, when I told my boss at the Indianapolis Times, I wanted to cover politics. He said, okay, we'll move you out of the sports department. We'll move you into the news department. I mean, it was just that simple for me. It wasn't, it wouldn't be simple for everybody, but it, it was for me. And when the Indianapolis Times went out of business, they literally uh, went bankrupt. Um, they helped me get a job as a political reporter for the a Kokomo newspaper. And from there, I moved to a Bloomington paper where I also uh, worked as a political writer. And one sort of interesting anecdote, when I was working for this political, this uh, paper in Bloomington, they, <clears throat> the, the owner was a big Richard Nixon fan. And um, he came down with a dictate that we, we were not gonna have anything negative said in the paper about Richard Nixon. And I was not, I was a political reporter and I was not going to buy into that. Now, I actually was sort of a, I believe Nixon was a good man, but I didn't think the, a journalist should take that approach. So I told the, told my editor, if that's the, the rule here, I'm leaving the paper, which I did. And, I, and almost a week later, I got a job at the Crosstown newspaper, the Herald Telephone, as their political reporter. But I mean, it's, it was kind of an interesting thing, but I always wanted to learn and to tell people what is going on in the in the world. 
Wow. To me, that's just so cool how they helped you too. I mean, because they, I mean, they had that confidence in you to know that you could just jump to anything and be successful at it. Right. So you may ask me how I got into the government. Well, I I was thinking at the time, I was, since I could not go to college out of high school, when Mm -hmm. I moved to Bloomington, I started, actually, I did this from the outset, but I was only doing it part time. But I started going to school full time. So I was going to school full time. And I was a political reporter for full time in Bloomington. And I was majoring in, not journalism. People said, you already are a journalist. Don't major in that. Major in something that you want to write about. And politics, to me, is about 90% about economics. Not economics in the sense that you might think, but we all have to make decision choices. And um, so I decided to major in economics, which I did. And when I came out of Indiana University with a degree in economics, I thought, you know, why don't I go to Washington, D.C., work on the federal government, maybe I can contribute to having a better economy in our country. And, and so I moved from, now that was the scary part. That was a, that, that must did, have been that, scary. That was scary because I had been nine years as a journalist and I loved the job. I loved going to work every day, but I decided I wanted to do something for the, for the country. And my, my choice was to go work as a, a government economist. Oh my gosh. What was the shock? I mean, there had to be something. Well, okay. I'm not sure what you mean the shock, but here's what happened to me. So I went to work for this, this, this uh, guy in the government. It was actually in the Census Bureau at the time, but I was making estimates of economic activity. And I told him that they were making these estimates in the wrong way. And I was able to prove it mathematically to him. And here's what he said to me. He said, if you work for the government, you're going to find out that if if the government does things wrong long enough, it becomes right. And I said, I'm not working for this guy anymore. Uh, And I, and I, I, about two weeks later, I got a job in another agency. But that, that was the shock to me because there are, there is that mind frame in certain people in the government that, if they do things wrong enough, it becomes right. And oh my uh, gosh! For the, for the years that I worked there, I worked thirty-three years after that. I never met anybody quite like that. I don't know if I want. I, you know what? Actually, I want him booted out of the office. <laughs> I did too, but I couldn't do that. <laughs> I could just boot me out. <laughs> oh my gosh! That's crazy. That is horrible. I yeah. mean, to have someone represent the America, I would have left too. Yes. I would have left to. And I'm glad you did. I'm glad you stood for what the American people need, you know, which is which is truth. Right. Real truth, not like eventual truth. No, (laughs) no, no. no. Such a thing. (laughs) Are facts and you can present those facts and you can do it. Really, you can do it. I think there's so much today that is sort of if one side is telling one story and the other side is telling other, but there really are ways to tell that same story in a more neutral and a more universal way. Uh, I'm sorry we don't see that more, but we we don't. Wow. Well, laughing through life is your story plus a few different extra sets and suches to make it interesting. So tell us about that book. Tell us, you know, uh, um, what should we be getting from that book? Well, I think you should, I hope you laugh. Um, I, w- one of my favorite stories and one of the stories that has best, best been best received is a story called Hoosier Hysteria, which is relevant right now. It's about, uh, I was a, a South, I'm sorry, junior in high school, and I had this big crush on this cheerleader, but I wasn't successful. And so um, I happened one afternoon to be at a roller rink in Noblesville, Indiana, and there she was. And what do teenage boys think? Faster and stronger is better. So I started rolling around the rink as fast as I could to impress this girl. And what do you think I did? Accidentally. You fell. Did you Donna, fall? I did, but right in front of this girl. Her name was Donna. I fell oh, right no. and she fell down. Now I didn't really impress her the way I had intended to impress her. So, uh, and I was really downhearted after that. And so I decided the only way for me to win her heart was to become a star basketball player. Well, Carmel is a small town. When I when we moved there, there were 500 people in the town. Uh, now, to, today, there's about 
90,000. There was there were 500 people. And, but I did make the team. I was able to make the team. All you had, had to do was run up and down the court without tripping over your own feet. And I made the team, but I never played in games. Just never played in games. Um, oh. And I was not going to impress Donna by not playing in games. No. Then to what's called the sectionals. It's like a like the NCAA tournament that's going on now, but at the state level. And it's it's really crazy in Indiana. People love that tournament. And we were in the finals of the sectional, the last game of the sectional. We were going to move on to the regionals. And I was on the bench and they never played me. We were playing a big school. They were our arch rivals, Noblesville. And I was hoping that I could get in that game and help win, and then I would impress Donna. Well, it didn't work out that way. Um, in the second half of the game, we sort of got two of our guys had been had, were, were home with the flu, and two guys had injured themselves. So there were six of us on the team, and I was the sixth guy, and I never got off the bench. But about two minutes to go in the basketball game, our star player fell down. And just lay on the floor. And everybody gathered around him. And the coach went out there and he said, Moran, come out here. I'm thinking, oh my God, this is my chance to become a big star. I can win this game for Carmel and I can impress Saint Adon Adonna. And uh, so I went out there and the coach looked at me and said, Larry, take off your pants. I said, what? He said, he said, Larry Isley's is ripped the seat off his pants. He needs your pants. And so I had to change, take off my pants and give them to Larry Isley. And that's how I made my contribution to Carmel High School basketball. Well, I mean, a lot of people would have thought that was a terrible experience. I actually thought it was funny. And it is so, funny. That, but at I, the same time, it is terrible. I mean, well, did well, you I have your it. boxers on? I did. But I mean, <laughs> so anyway, uh, they, they covered me up the best they <laughs> could. But so anyway, that's the kind of thing. Um, there are other stories. There are other stories like that that people might not, if they if that happened to them, um, might not really find. But I just I just am able to laugh at myself. I don't take myself too serious, you know. Um, and life is really good that way. Oh my gosh, I I literally blessed. imagined that. Yeah, I've been <laughs> blessed. I have a wonderful family. I have all these wonderful siblings. They're great people. I have four great kids. I love my kids. And so life is really good. That's wonderful. I'm so happy. And it wasn't with that girl, though. Not with that girl. <laughs> with that girl. Uh, there but, are a couple other stories. By the way, uh, I some of those stories that I put in there about my romantic experiences were absolutely true. Um, I, I, had a, I only had one blind date. And that was didn't work out as well, <laughs> well as I wanted it to. But anyway, you just have to say, smile and go forward. I That's think this would be a great movie. Are you going to do it? Are you doing a script or what are you doing? Well, I haven't really thought about it. People have mentioned it to me. I think this would actually might make a good TV show. I'm not sure you could do it in a movie because, well, you could do parts of it in a movie. Right. But, but um, some of the stuff that happens, I'll tell you a real quick, real quick story that happened when I was uh, working as, in the government. Now, this that would make this a movie a little bit too long. But it's a true story. When you live in Carmel, as we did, and that when it was real small, you had to learn to entertain yourself. And we did that very well. We played games. Actually, my sister Carol and my brother Howard and I put on plays for neighbors and friends um, in, our, in our garage or in our attic. But at any rate, when I was working for the government, I came home one year to visit, to visit my uh, uh, family. And we were sitting around the porch with some of my, my younger brothers, and we, I was saying, you know, Carmel's changed. When I was here, Carmel was so small, you could blindfold me, take me any place in the town, take the blindfold off, and I could be home in 10 minutes. Well, and my brother Danny said, well, I can do that. So no, you can't. So we blindfolded Danny. This was like about 10 o'clock at night. We blindfolded Danny. We took him someplace, and he got back in 10 minutes. Well, we were, we're, we're all impressed. And uh, there was a friend with us named Roger. And he said, I can do it too. And I had a plan. So I said, Roger, you can't do it. I bet you can't do it. So what we did was we, we blindfolded Roger. And the concept was we we're going to take him behind the school, 
take him into some wooded area, take the blindfold off. If he came out of the correct side of the woods, he would be able to get home. But if he didn't, he would have no idea where it was. So we put him in the back of the car. This is about 1.30 in the morning. Oh my gosh. We pulled, no. we pulled into the school parking lot <laughs> and we started to get out and we hear <laughs> police car pulls up. And this guy, I don't know, was it Barney Pfeiffer who it was? He says, stay in the car. So we all stayed in the car. Two other police cars showed up. And finally, a fourth car showed, police car showed up. And they said, get out and put your hands on the and on the car, there were just there were like four of us in the car at the time. And anyway, we one of my brothers, Howard, he wanted to fight the cops. Howard, they're doing their job. But anyway, um, we got out of the car, and we I, I figured since I was the oldest, I should be the one to explain this to the cops. So I told him what we were doing, and he said, "Let me see some ID." And so I showed him my government ID. That's what I had. It was easy. He looks at this ID. He says, "You work for the federal government." And you're playing hide and seek at one o'clock in the morning here. <laughs> he said, "No wonder the government's in terrible shape." <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> those are those are kind of stories that you would find in my book. Oh, you know, that is hilarious! Oh my gosh, that should be yeah, a TV show or even a short movie or something. Yeah. That's just amazing. I think you should go for it. Yeah, I would <laughs> literally want to see this. Like, where did this guy end up? I mean, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> especially on the basketball court in your boxers in giving box. your shorts to someone else that right there that i want to see <laughs> that anyway, is so amazing I, you can see that i sort of don't take myself too seriously i don't think like I, I think there are really important things that you have to be serious about but don't take yourself too seriously and life has its ups and downs yeah but you have to learn to laugh and that's what i yeah. want people to know learn to laugh that's it. That's it. Well, thank you so much, Larry, for being on the show. Where can people find your book, Laughing Through Laughter? Oh, oh laughing. Uh, laugh, through laugh. Life. Was it Laughter Through Life? I'm laughing no, through laugh, life. I'm laughing sorry. Through, laughing through life. That's okay. They can find it on Amazon. They think they can find it at Barnes and Noble. Well, it, it's out there. Awesome. Well, we'll put we'll put the link in the description box below. So it's laughing okay, through life. Laughing through life. Yeah. It's an, it's an Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Definitely. And we'll put that link in the description box below. So it'll be easy for you guys to go ahead and laugh through life. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. And thank it was you. And thank you. Oh, okay. uh, yes. When you come back or when you literally do a movie, you have to come back and let us know. I will do that. All right. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And I want to thank you guys so much for tuning in. Don't forget to dare to be different. And until next time, guys, don't forget to laugh through life. Until okay. next time. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you so much for stopping by. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. Hit that notification bell so you'll be notified the next time that I upload. And don't forget to dare to be different. Until next time, guys. I dare to be different. To be different.